massages the feet. My sturdy Chinese men don't give a fuck about you. One thing I love about the Monterey Park area is there's a lot of cheap places where you can get dope massages. Now, one of the issues that you might run into is that the people who do administer these massages don't really speak English. The great thing is, Mariel, that you guys don't know, is actually uh, quadrilingual. She speaks English, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Chinese specifically uh, Mandarin. So it kind of worked out for us in that in that kind of sense because she was allowed to communicate with these dudes very well. They allowed us to film because of her skills. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the place that we went to, they the upstairs area anyways, they specialize in like foot massages. Um, I'm ticklish on my feet, so I really didn't know how this was going to go down, but people told me that when you get a foot massage, it's different than when you actually get tickled. So they started it off by dipping my feet in boiling soup water, which was great, by the way. When I get a massage, I don't know what, I don't know if this is a lot of people, but I prefer getting massaged by a woman. Is that just me? But we didn't have that choice. We had three elderly uh, Chinese men that were going to do it, which is perfectly fine. I think I think old men are skilled, which means that they've done it for many years. So I was completely okay with that. Didn't know who I was going to get, but they seem very uh, apt at what they're doing. You just massaged all my thoughts. It's very interesting. I never had a head massage before, but that felt crazy good. At one point, I thought he was going to scalp me because his hands are so strong. Like when you get a massage and you get massaged by a man that looks like you in the future, I have a feeling that's what it was. It was me in the future. I was like, what the fuck? Are you my father? There's a tickle. It does. Wow. At first, I'll try not to laugh so hard. <laughs> it's like the massage is overpowering the ticklinish. Ticklinish? The ticklish. Yeah, is. So there's <laughs> Now mind you, when you get an Asian massage, understand that it's not like that, oh yeah, so good type of massage that you see like that white people get. I think they do something called acne pressure. So they're hitting certain like parts of your feet that are supposed to affect another part of your body that helps you relax and to kind of like release the tension in your muscles. So it is gonna hurt a little bit, but there's a purpose to it. It's about pay now, feel good later. Asian massages is just exactly representative of, a of Asian culture. Your parents beat you now, so you end up being a doctor later. I think he's talking to me through my feet. It's interesting because I can feel his knuckles in every fiber of my foot. It feels good, but it tickles at the same time. It's like being fed a sandwich and then getting punched in the stomach. I think I'm a terrible boyfriend because whenever something bad happens to Mariel, it makes the first thing I do is laugh. It just it's funny to me. So like, you know, you expect she was she was the one who wanted the massage, but as she was getting it, I don't know what's going on. They're speaking to each other in Mandarin, but she's in a lot of pain and it's making me laugh. It makes me happy that she's hurting. <laughs> How dare you? Tell him to continue what he's doing. Oh, <laughs> now, I don't think she enjoyed me laughing at her because, once again, I don't speak Mandarin, so I don't know what the fuck happened, but she kind of looked at me with this evil stare. She says something in Mandarin. <laughs> my guy, who's massaging my feet, starts to laugh. <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay. Then, I'm in excruciating pain. <laughs> what did I do to you?
don't you like how the shoe fits? something. I don't know what the fuck it was, but that man was massaging my soul. <laughs> Karma. You don't mess with Mary. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> It just looked like you needed a little more pressure. I don't think they understood what stop it hurts means because as I was in more pain, screaming, he did it more. Whether this is a language barrier thing or he thought he was a funny guy, I don't know. But fuck him. He's so strong. <laughs> this is why you never mess with your girlfriend. Especially when she's the only one that can speak the language of the people that are doing things to your feet. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> He's so strong. Say <laughs> shoe full. Was that anything here? Comfortable. Comfortable? That was some hell to get to. Things are harder. Here's the funny thing. So, he was massaging my back, right, which it felt great. But the weird thing is, when your head is, is in that massage table, you can only imagine what they're doing to you as they're giving you that massage. So, I felt these elbows from my shoulder blade all the way down to my lower back. Now, in my mind, I'm like, how is he doing this? What, what position is his body in? And it only clicked to me later on because I felt warmth on the back of my neck. I was like, oh, he must have, like, a hot towel there. It wasn't a hot towel. The guy had his ball sack on the back of my head as he was rowing back and forth from my shoulder blade to my lower back. He basically teabagged the fuck out of me. So there's three guys, and out of all three of them, I got the teabag master. And I think it's only his technique. He wasn't doing that to other people. I was the only one that got teabagged. Felt great, though. Very strong man. Very strong. I don't know I'm not sure what was happening, but I'm almost a hundred percent sure I felt the ball sack on my head. <laughs> Can he put a ball sack on my head? <laughs> I was like, what what point in his body is he putting me in and how is he reaching there? And if that's an elbow, that's a ball sack on my head. <laughs> Last time I came here, like same guy, I was in a private room and uh so were you clothed or not? I just had underwear on, and then uh, he put his knees right on my head, so my head's right here. And he so went, his ball sack was on my head. <laughs> See, I couldn't figure out what was, what was, I was like, that has to be his elbows. But how is he getting his elbows from there to there? And I was like, there's fabric on my head, and his ball sack is on my head. It must be like his style, like the ab roller. <laughs> I think she's a gang leader. I think those are like her homies. That is not what you said. You said something evil. I did not. And all I heard was him giggle. Then he started. <laughs> then he started punching my feet. I was like, how are you punching? Maybe the use out of the money that you. It was perfect the way it was before. It's okay. I was in pain too. I know. You should have left it at that. <laughs> I think when you go to a beef tissue massage place, just know that there is going to be some pain but there is relief on the other side you just gotta be strong enough to endure it what i like about this place number one they don't teach you on time number two they have a sense of humor and number three they do really good work i mean this is my first time here and and they're really cheap by the way that that one hour massage was 20 bucks and on average what you know some people pay on a meal so that's relief for the whole week for 20 dollars. i'm pretty sure every now and then you guys can spend it on that uh, but expect to be a little bit of pain or just don't get a girlfriend that says secret languages to them to hurt you thank you happy massage spa it was awesome you guys are fantastic <laughs> Wow.
All right, welcome to TYT Interviews. We are going to have what I hope is one of the most interesting interviews we've ever done. It's with Sam Harris. Uh, he has a BA in philosophy from Stanford, a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA. You might be familiar with some of his books, The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and Future of Reason, Letter to a Christian Nation, The Moral Landscape. How are we feeling today? Are you ready for a debate between Dinesh and Schenck? All right, all right. Well, uh, we're going to have a good time tonight, that, that I can tell you. Um, so I have the great pleasure of moderating this debate, and uh, we're going to have a constructive conversation. Keyword, the operative word is constructive. Um, but let, let's, let's uh, bring them out here. First, I want to introduce an award-winning filmmaker, an award-winning author. He has a new movie coming, out, movie coming out called Hillary's America. Give it up for Dinesh D'Souza. exact life purpose. <coughs> you know your destiny. I'm going to show you three ways you can figure it out. In Conversation with the Mystic is a series that's rapidly gained momentum and popularity ever since its inception. If you make your, if you make your body very pleasant, it be so there's version. Straight away, I was taught. So how was it when you were? A the idea of making a mold is that we want to have the same form again and again and again. Right now, generally, that seems to be the work, unfortunately, of the current education system, the so-called religions that are operating in the world, and of course the family. They want you to be in a certain mold. They don't want you to blossom like a wildflower because they're afraid of anything fresh happening among them. They want something that is familiar. They don't want something unfamiliar to be born among them. So if you have succumbed to that system, then yes, you've been molded into a certain form. If you allow your humanity to blossom, then you will see you don't belong to any mold. This is the beauty of being human, that there is no a particular way to be. If you were a dog, you would be one way. If you were cattle, you would be one way. If you were a sheep, you would be another way. If you were a bird, you would be another way. A grass, grasshopper, another way. But to be human means there is no particular way. What is human is not defined, not described. It is, it is just that. For every other creature on this planet, Nature drew two lines. Within that, they have to play their game. For a human being, only the bottom line is drawn. There is no top line. But socially, people are trying to draw a top line for themselves. But nature has not drawn a top line for you. It's a limitless possibility. And this is what is freaking human beings right now, because they can't decide what they <laughs> need to be. They're trying to be like somebody else. Only bottom line is set, top line has been removed. This is evolution. But w w wait, uh, we still didn't quite get to. So how was it when you were a child, were you, were you put into a school to go the systematic way and did do you I, keep up with it? Do I look that edu educated? Don't insult me like that. <laughs> Actually, you know, when I go and stand in the line, in the immigration lines, and particularly in America, they look at me and say, can you speak English? Because I have that uneducated look, it's not easy. Do you know? Do you know what it takes to remain uneducated? Education is just 20 years of going somewhere and getting one certificate. To remain uneducated, it's very difficult. Because from the day you are born, your parents, every other adult, the school, the damn thing, everybody is trying to educate you yes. about something that's not worked in their life. <laughs> and then, did, 
But you also, like we all went through these confused teenage years of not really knowing where we're going. I mean, did you clearly know your path? Not at all. I was, uh, right from three or four years of age, I was always a million questions hanging in, in my head. I have a question about everything, everything to everything. Questions means very fundamental questions about existence itself, my own existence. So when I was three, four years of age, suddenly I realized I know nothing. Know nothing means somebody gives me a glass of water, I do not know what is water. I know how to use it, I know if I drink it, it will quench my thirst and so many other ways of using it. But I do not know what is water. I'm saying even today you do not know what is water. It's the only thing available in all three states on the planet. Three, two thirds of the planet is water, two thirds of your body is water. If you think life, we think water. But do you know what it is? With all the scientific exploration, we do not even know a single atom in its entirety. Today our idea of science is learning how to use everything. Yes, we know how to use an atom, we know how to break it, we know how to fuse it, but we really do not know what it is. Any one thing, tiniest thing in the creation, we do not know in its entirety. This is the fact of life. Well, even something simple as what you started with saying that looking at water, I mean, straight away I was taught water, H2O, and what it can do when it, you can mix it with colors and it becomes that. You can drink it and it quenches your thir thirst. But I never looked at it and said, you know, I don't really know what is water. Because nobody looks at anything. See, everybody is looking like this. Nobody has any attention for a piece of life here. They're like this. If you pay attention to one life, one blade of grass, one grasshopper, one human being, something else will happen. That's why we said life and love, because if you pay attention to one human being, some love will happen within you, okay? If you miss life, at least some emotion in that direction must happen to you. That will happen only if you pay attention to one. If you're looking at like this, these days it's become a fashion because you're on love on Facebook. You love the whole humanity. <laughs> to love one human being, if you want to love one human being, it costs life. To love the whole humanity, it doesn't cost anything. It's even better to love God, because it's always easy to love somebody who's not here now. <laughs> it's so easy. But if you have to love somebody who's sitting next to you right now, it costs life. You know how difficult it is to love someone who's next to you right now? How easy it is to love someone who is dead or who is in heaven? Isn't it so? Let's face it. Because if you have to love one, one thing is you have to pay attention. Without attention it will not happen. And above all, you have to give up something that is you to accommodate another. Otherwise it will not happen. The English expression is very good. You must fall in love. You cannot rise in love. You cannot stand in love. You cannot fly in love. You have to fall. Something of you should fall. Otherwise, it will not work. You will not know it. So, you want to have a fake sense of life, then you don't pay attention to anything. Everything is... So, there's versions of it. I just want to know. See, so, the, sim you... the simple way of make you keep coming back to me is to give you something that you cannot do. To give you a teaching which you can never do. You must love, but you must be detached. Now you have to keep coming back to me for consultation. Endless. <laughs> I'm saying throw yourself into your love affair and die into it. Something will happen. Something worthwhile will happen if you're willing to die into the process. Not just anything, whether it's your work or your life or your love or whatever. If you do not know how to throw your entire self into it, you will never know the taste of what it is. Love but be detached. Why do you want to love then? <laughs> Only because you want to include somebody as a part of your life, part of yourself. That's why you love. No, I love but I am detached. This means you have to come back to consultation every day. It's like a psychiatrist's job. Every day you have to come and sit on the couch. You need treatment and there is a fee. So, 
What? Okay, all right. So you can love and be attached. No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, I'm coming back for consultation, please. So what did you say? <laughs> I only said, see, what is this need for love in a human being? You must understand, a human being constantly, constantly, a human being is longing to be something more than what they are right now. If this finds a simple, basic physical expression, we call this sexuality. Sexuality means just this, physically you're trying to make something which is not you a part of yourself. For a few moments you may succeed. If you try this mentally, it gets labeled as greed, conquest, or maybe simply shopping. Shopping, shopping. Some people go for conquest with swords and guns, some people go with checkbooks and cash, you know, credit cards. The thing is you want to include something which is not a part of you as yourself, that is the whole effort. Whether you want money or wealth or you want to occupy a nation, what is it? Something that is not you, you want to make it yours. Yours is an effort to make it a part of yourself. If it happens emotionally, on the emotional level if you try this, we call this a love affair. You're trying to make somebody who is not a part of you, a part of yourself emotionally. This is a love affair. If you do it consciously, we call this yoga. Yoga means union. So all these efforts are fine, everything has its own beauty but has its own limitations. When you understand the limitations of all the other methods, nothing right or wrong about it, it is just that it will work briefly, it will not work for always. When you realize that, you consciously try to include. When you consciously become an inclusive process, if you sit here, if you experience everything as yourself, then we say you are a yogi, okay? So this is a love affair successful. So something you said at the end which I would like to ask you again. You said love, inclusiveness. I can't understand how I can love everybody in this room. You cannot. There are some people you cannot love. I can barely see <laughs> up there and up there. So how is that? How do you include everybody in your love? See, because you are looking at love as something that comes to you or you yield to the process of love only because you appreciate a particular quality, a shape of somebody's nose or the shape of their mind or their thought or their emotion or the way they speak or the way they do things or the way they relate to you, something, okay, the many, many things. It is based on something that is acceptable to you. If they do something that is not acceptable to you, Love crumbles. Yes. <laughs> now what I'm saying is, I want you to look at this. Whether love happens to you or hate happens to you, anger happens to you, misery happens to you, joy happens to you, it only happens within you, isn't it? Yes. It never. People say love is in the air. No. <laughs> because you are feeling very pleasant in your emotions, suddenly air feels vibrant. It always been. You missed it all your life. Now you are beginning to feel it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, whatever human experience, love or hate, whatever, whatever, happens only within you. What I'm saying is, at least what happens within you must happen by your choice. Consciously, you must be able to make it happen. If you are able to, if your experience of what is happening within you is happening by choice, what is the problem? It only happens within you. Love is not a relationship. A relationship is a different thing. Love is a certain sweetness of your emotion. Whether you look at a tree or a dog or a man or a woman or a child or just at the sky, why can't you look at it lovingly? Because it's not about loving the sky. It's about the sweetness of your emotion. If your emotions are sweet, whatever you look at, you look at it in a certain way. Right now you have nasty emotions, so whatever you look at, you look at it in a different way. So you have always associated love with somebody. No, 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 this is not about somebody. Love is not something that you do. It is something that you can become. 
if you're willing, you can become love. You can make your emotion into a very sweet space. You can, if, you make your, if you make your body very pleasant, it becomes pleasure. If you sit here, it can be a great pleasure just sitting here and breathing. If your mind becomes pleasant, we say this is joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we say this is love. If your very life energies become pleasant, we say this is blissfulness, this is ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call that success. Now you're calling your success with somebody as love. That's a mistake. You have a success story with somebody. That is, you have created pleasantness in the atmosphere between you and let's say five, ten people around you. You're calling that love. No, that is actually success because that needs lots of management. Yes, it does. Yes or no? Yes, it does. Yes, but for you to be loving, there is no management. If you just make your emotions sweet, your emotions are sweet and it's beautiful to be like this. It's not about anybody. If somebody comes, we can share it. If nobody comes, you can sit here with your eyes closed and still be loving. What's the problem? It is not about somebody. It's not an action. It is not something that you do. It is something that you can become. It's a, it's a lovely, idyllic sleep. A lady went to sleep. In her sleep, she had a dream. I think up there. Oh, there are two straight off people. Nobody's asleep, right? <laughs> so that I could pick on you, I'm just looking if I can see. She went to sleep up there <laughs> and in her dream, she had a dream. In her dream, she saw a hunk of a man standing in that corner. And then he started coming closer and closer and closer. He came so close she could even feel his breath. She trembled, not in fear. <laughs> and then she asked, what will you do to me? The man said, well, lady, it's your dream. I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay. saying, what's happening in your mind is your bloody dream. Now, the problem with life is that not that life is not happening the way you want it, even your dream is not happening the way you want it. That's a problem. <laughs> I'm saying at least fix this. At least let the dream happen the way you want it. If you are dreaming the way you want right now, your thought and your emotion would be pleasant, isn't it? Yes, but it, well... Fixing the world is another thing. That's a different game. That needs a lot of skill. This needs just willingness. Why are we continuously talking about joy, blissfulness, love? Is not because it's a goal by itself. These are not goals by itself. Only by, when you're pleasant by your own nature, you stop being in pursuit of happiness. You are fine by yourself. You don't have to go anywhere to feel pleasant. You don't have to do anything to feel pleasant. Sitting here, you're feeling very pleasant. Now you will look at life the way it is. Otherwise, you're an endless race. Pursuit of your happiness is a lifelong thing till your deathbed you're pursuing. What does it mean? That means you're a failure. If you're pursuing happiness when you were five, I can understand. But that was not the fact. When you're five, you're simply happy by your own nature. When you're fifty, you're pursuing your happiness. So this is a failed story, isn't it? <laughs> but Sadhguruji, suppose we say this to the common man who has a little house. Where did you meet a common man? <laughs> I'm imagining it. <laughs> Every man and woman think they're special, believe me. Oh, yes. Yes, so where did you meet a common man, I'm asking? Oh. <laughs> okay, Sadhguruji, when you said about the common person and the special person, I know some teachers have always told us and why your parents always tell you that, you know, you are special. Each one of us is unique. I remember this part, I'm not sure whether I heard it at your discourse or on a DVD of yours where you said it was about, you know, people being special and us always thinking that God knows of us. And you said something like, do you know all the grasshoppers in your garden? So, of course, all of us have said no. So you said something like, so how does God know each one of you then? And I was devastated because I always thought somebody thought, out there knows me. You thought you, were number, you thought you were number one on his book, is it? <laughs> 
Well, I've been told since I was a kid, you're Let special, you're unique, and God cares about you. If when somebody says you're unique, it's an insult. <laughs> No, yeah, no, you said no top line, so you are okay. <laughs> peeking in different okay. ways. In this vast cosmos, this solar system is just a speck. Tomorrow morning, if the whole solar system disappears, vanishes, evaporates, nobody will even notice it. Maybe it's not even in the account books of creation. It's so small. In this speck of a solar system, planet Earth is a super speck. In that, Mumbai is a micro super spec. In that, you are a big man or a woman. That's a huge problem. This is a very immense existential problem. <laughs> this is because we have lost perspective as to who we are, what we are. Our psychological realities have become bigger than the cosmo cosmic reality. That is a big problem. It's time. You step out of your cinema. I'm, I'm not talking about the uh, Hindi cinema. I'm talking about the cinema that everybody is playing in their own minds. See, a cinema, see right now, they darken this whole hall because it works best that way. This is the basic technology of a cinema. If you do not darken the cinema hall, if you light it up and play a nice cinema, it's not going to work. You have to darken it. So I'm saying a cinema of your mind because it's a dark space. Every thought is enlarged, playing out bigger than the cosmic space. Today, everything in the cosmos is happening perfectly well, but you have one nasty thought crawling in your head and it feels like a bad day, isn't it? Yes. But yeah. so that's because your psychological realities, your petty creation has become larger than the creator's creation. You lost perspective of life. That is the fundamental basis of all this confusion and suffering. If you see who you are, the micro speck that you are, you wouldn't imagine that God is made in your own image and he looks like you and whatever. Okay? If, if we were all buffaloes, we would definitely think God is a big buffalo. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what is it really? <laughs> please tell us the... Please define it for us. What is it? What is going on? This life, this love, all these emotions that we go through in, in